It's been almost a year since Inazuma came out and Sumeru is almost here. My last two or three theories on Sumeru have a lot of interesting information about Sumeru. It may also explain why I brush off on some details. I will one by one explain everything you should know before stepping onto Sumeru. It's low in Hoyoverse game, so I'm going to miss one or two. But everything interesting is here. Number one. As Yaemigo and many other researchers have told over and over again, Sumeru is the region of knowledge. Although the god is wisdom, Sumeru uses knowledge as a resource. Number two. During the very first Tevat story teaser, Dainsliff told everyone that Sumeru's god is the god of wisdom. She is also the Archon of Dendro. The role Kusunali plays in the Academia is currently up to debate. But since she is voiced by the one and only Teresa Apocalypse's voice actor, she would be the principal of the Academia. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. As most of us have figured out, Nahida is the Archon of Sumeru. In the Sumeru teaser number 3, a wide range of characters were introduced and Nahida was one of them. As you can see, she does not carry a vision like a regular playable character and her hair tapes are colored green like the other Archons. But unlike the other Archons in Inazuma, Liyue and Mondstadt, she is not one of the originals nor took part in the Archon war. That is as for the information we currently have. Ganyu from Liyue Archon Questline introduced the Dendro Archon as the youngest Archon who was only in power for a measly 500 years. As humans, measly is not a word to describe 500 years. But for a god or an immortal, 500 years is like 5 years of their life? And Yae Miko introduced her as Lesser Lord Kusunali. Densif calls out Kusunali for having wisdom itself as her enemy, giving a meaning that understanding something's true purpose <coughs> Celestia, may become a double-edged sword. She is called the God of Wisdom specifically because her consciousness is directly connected to the Irminsul tree. It's like the Dendro Archon is the humanoid manifestation of the tree itself, or the emissary of the tree. Also, the trailer says when she started to dance, every step she took bloomed flowers. It's really similar to what happened when Lord Buddha was born. The moment he was born, he took seven steps, and each step bloomed a lotus. Then he said this will be his last reincarnation. In the recent PV, Kusanare talks about how she is the moon and the real sun is already gone, saying that the previous Dendro Archon is now gone. Number 3. Since we are on the topic of Archon, why not add the previous Archon to the mix? Previous Dendro Archon, the god of foods, according to the confirmed sources, is dead. The people of Academia believe since Kusanali was born, Rukadevata is dead. But there are few theories floating around claiming that they are still alive and hiding. And there are some people in Sumeru that believe she is not actually dead. After the third teaser, the previous Dendro Archon was dubbed as the Greater Lord Ruksha Devata. Get it? Greater Lord and Lesser Lord, Previous and Current? Interesting fact that only people who know the language derived from Sanskrit know. Ruka or Ruksha means tree and Devata means God. Instead of saying Devathava, which is singular for a god, they went with Devatha. Devatha was used in a complicated manner. It's used when a group of gods had to be included with another word. For example, Devatha Mandala, which means God's court, or a goddess in some cases. So, in that way, Greater Lord Rukka Devatha is they or she literally. But the recent trailer confirmed Rukka Devatha is a female. Number 4. With Sumeru, the Dendro element is going to be released. With it, we are also getting two new reactions related to Dendro. Currently, Dendro only reacts with Pyro to give burn reactions. Burn reactions continuously burn the enemy over time for a specific interval. The new reactions will be between Dendro and Hydro for Bloom and Dendro and Electro for Catalyze. Unfortunately, Dendro and Cryo reaction was not teased. So, for now, there are no reactions between them. But we are hoping for some kind of reaction between them too. My personal headcanon reaction is called Preserve. Vegetables in a fridge? Makes sense? When a character triggers Bloom, it will leave a flower bud behind. They said Bloom is related to the recovery aspect of Hydro and catalyzing of Dendro. Most of the community believed Bloom will give packets of healing. But the 3.0 livestream explained that the Dendro course left behind by the Bloom reaction will appear up to three times. 
when they hit that limit or in their duration they will explode with aoe dendrodamage think of it as how some plants explode their fruit to spread seeds when one of these dendrocores get hit by pyro attack that triggers burgeon to create an even bigger aoe explosion and when electro hits that dendrocore the core will become a homing missile that will hit the target in chemistry catalysis reactions involve using a catalyst to accelerate the reaction speed without affecting the initial products so taking that as a basis when catalyzed triggered by dendro first and electro second quicken will occur this will buff the next electro attack on the quickened enemy but when quenching stellato triggers the reaction the following electro infused attack hits two times maybe this increased damage will double the regular attack damage reverse the reaction order to electro first and dendro second then it will trigger spread that will buff the next dendro attack on the reacted enemy number 5 one thing that cannot be left out when talking about sumeru is the academia based on the ancient university nalanda sumeru academia is divided into six darshans governed by their own sage the fountain inside the academia has these ancient runes carved on it they say nihil sub sol no which means there is nothing new under the sun this might be their way of saying that academia and its researchers will uncover all knowledge in this world an obvious code given their connection to knowledge like its real life counterpart sumeru academia accepts its students from all over the world from people like lisa to mad scientists like dotore number 6 we see them in every region look around monster library there is one look in wangshuin there is another one and try to walk through rito in inazuma enjoy the blessing of lesser lord to sanali a nation blessing now 10% off idiot who thinks compost is a god's blessing ha huh, maybe it's actually a genius business strategy all right i was supposed to say since sumeru is associated with academia there are a lot of researchers they do research and assignments until their hair turns white from stress they have strict regulations concerning graduation requirements when these researchers can't submit a suitable study they keep on trying some researchers are old when they graduate but people like lisa were to say the least forcefully graduated as i said in my previous point the researchers and students are categorized into six sects the main subjects are ley line related studies study of ancient ruins and biology others are too obscure to say specifics with current information number 7 As Mr Yogat said the people of Sumeru are also known as the people who do not dream it's not that they are biologically different from other humans but they are grounded in reality too much doing research and knowing about the world they are realists and do not have the mindset to dream about the future like Yamiko said people in Sumeru use their knowledge as a resource instead of mora they exchange knowledge so depending on the situation Price ranges in Sumeru could be way too high or way too low. As you can see from the wide array of characters, a common thing with them is using gems and jewelry. As it happens, Hindus believe wearing jewelry gives them power and energy. Similar beliefs are there amongst both Egyptians and Middle Eastern people too, but not to the extent of wearing them as a daily necessity. That is what's reflected in these characters. Also there are few factions and families in Sumeru. They do their own research and exploration within the academia. Hexen Circle is a witch circle conducting research on the Irumensul tree and Alice is an elder of it. Other than that, there are family lineage schools like the House of Purveronis and the House of Purisina who pursues astrology. The dichotomy between the regular residents of Sumeru and the researchers is huge. Researchers know everything while ordinary people like Wahid here know absolutely nothing. Although adults in Sumeru can't dream, children who are not yet into research can dream. They also see these little spirits that roam deep in the forest. As you remember during Vente's quest, we used a gadget from Lisa to see children's imaginary friends. What do you think? Will we use a similar gadget in Sumeru? Number 8 
From the information we currently have, Sumeru is divided into two parts, rainforests and deserts. The academia is going to be in the forest area, so it is going to be the main focus of the region. The desert area will be where all the ruins and the ermines are located. So it's going to be another monster to its dragon's wine situation, but a lot bigger, probably. And there seems to be erosion happening throughout some parts of the forest. Is it accelerated by the God of Wood's death? Or is it something that happened since the very beginning of this world? As far as I know, Middle East and Egypt do not have these kinds of rainforest type vegetation. It's all deserts as far as the eye can see, with palm trees and other dry zone plants. Speaking of countries, let's move on to number 9. Sumeru is based on a wide variety of cultures from all over South Asia and Persian Empire, mainly Indian, Arabic and Egyptian. From the new trailer, the storyline is based on Sumer civilization. The area around the academia and the forest are mostly related to Indian culture, because Nalanda University was located in India. As with names like Al Haytham, Nahida, Wahid, Ayesha, and more, the naming convention of most characters is Arabic. The clothing conventions are tied to all different areas. Al Haytham is wearing clothes similar to Zhongli in the sense of westernized version of native clothes. Nilo's outfit is like an Arabic dancer. Google it, I'm not going to show the real thing because I'm not taking any chances at getting any kind of restriction from YouTube. If you listen to the few great oysters we heard from the amazing teasers, the music is related to these real life regions. The music in the first ever teaser from the live stream was really close to what you would hear in Egypt related media. Then the Dendro teaser brought us some Mughal Empire era music from India. The second Sumeru teaser was the most nostalgic for me. The music from the bamboo flute was amazing and was used as far as Indian mythologies go. And the third teaser, music brought together a wide array of cultures. Starting from Egyptian music, transitioning to Arabic, to Indian and ending with Egyptian again. Number 10. Within the 2.8 patch, Oevers released 7 new characters that will come after 3.0 is released. Within those 7 characters, 4 of them will be using the brand new Dendro element. Tinare, the first ever Dendro 5 star character we will have the chance to get our hands on in Genshin history. One of the forest watchers who seems to be Kole's senior. Kole is one of the most anticipated characters from even before the game was released. She first appeared in the story in the official manga as she was escaping the Fatui's grasp. Although she was harsh at first, Amber's cheerful personality lightened her up. From the looks of it, she will play a significant role in the upcoming Sumeru Archon quest. Dory, a new, from the looks of it, Foster, Electro character we will meet in Sumeru. Tignari, from before, say that she is a merchant with everything you need but at a hefty price. Next, we have the brand new characters with no solid information. First up, Al Haytham, a member of the Harvatath of the Sixth Darshans, who will meet us by chance at Port Omos. From the looks of it, he is a Dendrovision wielder and has a relatively large earpiece compared to the Akasha earpiece other people wear. Wonder what's that for? Next, we got to see the second ever fake cat girl, whom I will definitely pull. Dehia is one of the desert folk and a member of the Ermites wielding a pyrovision. Then we have the lovely Nilo who pursues dancing in a region of researchers. She carries a hydrovision and seems to be the person responsible for doing the Sub-Zero's festival dance to celebrate Kosunali's birthday. This dance is a replica of what Kosunali did that bloomed flowers. So is this the solution for the erosion in the forest? At this point, it's kinda obvious that Nahida is Kusanali. She has her pointy ears like Lee, Pulsinella and Yansa, which makes her one of the unaging species like Alice. I mean, wouldn't it even matter when she's a god? Finally, we have the equally anticipated character Sino, another character from the Genshin manga. As for Lisa's request, he is responsible for sealing the Archon residue in Kole's body. Although I jokingly said General Mahamatra, means General Big Time, it would actually mean General Mahamatra, which could mean a high-ranking member of the court or government. 
So in our case, he's probably one of the sages overseeing one of Dash, and he is also a user of an electrovision. Number eleven. As far as the eye can see, it's all sand in the desert areas of Sumeru. Like Dragon's Bay, deserts in Sumeru are going to be the home to an ancient civilization that got wiped out ages ago. It's possible that they suffer the same fate as Salvandagnia, Sasam Upside Down Ruins, and Surumi Island. But we'll have to wait and see how the storyline in the desert plays out. As for the information we have, the people who lived in these ruins had much advanced technology like Khandria, like these robots that slightly resemble the defense mechanisms of Dragon's Bay, and the elephant in the room, the upside down pyramids that spits fire. Dehia seems to be wearing an ornament that resembles it. Nothing much can be said about it right now. As for the information on it is very limited, but just a hunch of mine, a celestial nail might be hiding there. Although they might have worshipped gods that resemble Horus and Sobek, as they are made into statues beside the ruins. It's also said that the ruins will contain a Tataragami, dead gods miasma effect that mutates monsters within the ruins. Number twelve. Yes, I decided to dedicate a whole section for them. Samarand was a special case since it was affected by the ley line disorder in the chasm, and most Shroomkin in Sumeru will not talk like that. But it's fascinating how they have evolved into various forms, including symbiosis with other wildlife. Higher forms of fungi will develop animalistic behavior and will become territorial and aggressive. Also, while you might farm the Shrooms in the chasm every day. There is a chance you will need to farm them again using specific elements, as the drops change according to how they are defeated. Number thirteen. For now, three bosses can be confirmed: the Electro Regiswine. Since Inazuma introduced the Electro Vapor Flappers, a Regiswine was unavoidable. Dory and Sino will probably use the drops from it. Then we saw the higher form of fungi that looked like a chicken. It will most probably provide the materials needed for Tinari. And Kole coming in the 3.0 patch, and also a mini boss, elite enemy that looks like a headless dinosaur made with Khandrian technology. I'm sure by the time 3.1 comes around, there will be a weekly boss. Will it be Dotori or Scaramouche or something way different? Give your thoughts in the comments, but please don't leak. The desert ruins will also contain a boss of sort, cause it sounds like a great place to put a boss. Number 14. Simple as it is, Akasha means sky, and Akasha system is sky system. People of Sumeru use their knowledge as a resource, and it's managed through the Akasha system. It was something created by the previous Dendro Akan, but was never put into place while they were ruling Sumeru. They were killed in the Cataclysm 500 years ago, but the system is powered by the Gnosis powered legacy. It's something Roksha Devata passed down through the gnosis after they died. Even so, the earpiece is a gadget manufactured by the academia. Akasha is similar to Akashic. So if we take a look at Akashic records, it's a theoretical library of sort that stores everything in the universe, past, present, and future. But I think in the Akasha system situation, each individual's mind is the storage, and the Akasha system manages transactions. In cryptocurrency words, the person's mind is the wallet, knowledge is the currency, and the gnosis-powered legacy is the gigaset GPU that handles all the transaction. Number fifteen, as with every region's puzzles, Sumeru will force you to use Dendro characters to solve them. But taking a step further, they will interact with each element differently, giving a new outcome. As you can see, the mushroom jumping pad only activates when the Dendro is applied. Pyro will shrivel it up. An electro will make it bounce. Similar to that, there will be puzzles that involve reactions between all three elements. Other than that, we'll see puzzles that resemble what we have seen over the past years, but with Sumeru's twist. The first few events from 3.0 patch will revolve around introducing these puzzles, as 2.0 did in Inazuma. Number 16. In the more greener area, there is a port, Port Omos. Nothing too much is known about this place. But we'll meet Alhaytham there. And compared to the Sumeru city controlled by the academia, the port area is much easygoing, and a lot of merchants gather for trade. 
the oxygen that sells the divine knowledge capsule should also be in this area. Since we are currently in Inazuma, we'll directly go to Sumeru from Inazuma with Beido. So like Inazuma's Rito, Port Omos will be the first area we step foot into. And Alhetham will be our guide like child was in Liyue. Or, oh, since Zhongli is now a parallel banner with Tenare, there is a possibility he will play a role in us getting to Sumeru. If that is the case, he might make a path for us through Liyue using his god powers. Number 17. Geography wise, Sumeru is stunning. The overhead trees that cover entire areas of the map and canyons in the desert seemingly span forever. Since Sumeru is connected to Natalan, Fontaine and Liyue, the closer we get to each region, it will show different geographical formations. Deserts will be close to Natalan since hot and drier the area, the less vegetation it will have. While northern regions will be rainforest close to Fontaine, the nation dedicated to water. Port Omos is directly below Liyue, facing the sea on the east and connected to the lake next to the chasm. Although there seems to be a few paths leading to Sumeru through the chasm, they are all cut off. So sea routes are the only viable options for most people. Also there are spirit villagers that only children can see. As Ms. Maizi told, we will encounter many unknown areas while helping these spirits. I wonder how that's going to play out. Number 18. Finally, we are getting female treasure hoarder type enemies. Kazuma will be proud. Ermites are one of the new enemies we are getting with Sumeru. Similar to treasure hoarders, but much more organized. They originate from the ancient tribe of desert folk in Sumeru, but they are not part of any region's force. They are their own army working as mercenaries. And Dehia is one of these ermites. If child can be playable, and friends with us while we slaughter Fatuvi, I guess that gives Dehya the green light to be playable as well. The thing that I can't wrap my head around is the fact that they are mercenaries and yet aggressive towards us. Who exactly is paying them to attack us? In the Sumeru Archon quest, they will play a massive role. As we saw in the trailer, the Eremite leader got the Divine Knowledge capsule and got corrupted or something. When a god can't handle this knowledge for too long, how will a mortal be able to do anything without having any negative effects? Hold on a second. Huh. Interesting. Eremites are organized to some extent, but they do not have too much influence to affect an Archon quest alone. Let's see who this unknown backer is. Number 19. Look at these weird abominations. At least they are different from the same old pose we see every day. There are various kinds of mushroom species and animals that are affected by these fungi. Also, animals that resemble a mix of real-life animals well exist. That includes a new bird species, looks like a toucan. An event coming up in 3.0 will revolve around us capturing photos of these animals. The spirits that only children can see are also there. Number 20. Finally, we are at the last point. The two robots in the forest and the desert. Maybe these are robots from Khandria that got defeated or deactivated in Sumeru. If you look closely, these roots and vines entrap both these giants. It's like someone deliberately stopped them from moving. Maybe the god of woods sacrificed themselves while trying to stop them. For 500 years, they have become home to many animals and trees. Wouldn't it be cool to see both of them reactivate at the same time? A few extra information from the live stream. We will get 4 banners during the 3.0 patch. Phase 1 will have Tinari and Zhongli with Koli as the poster. Phase 2 will have Ganyu and Kokomi as reruns and Dori as the poster. There will be 5 events in total and the patch duration now is reduced to 5 weeks instead of the usual 6 weeks. 2 new artifact sets were teased. Deep Wood Memories, 2 piece set will give 15% dendro damage bonus and 4 piece set reduces the dendro resistance by 30% of the enemy hit by elemental scale or elemental burst for 8 seconds. Second set, Gilded Dreams, 2 piece set will give 80% EM and 4 piece set will give a wall of text. When the reaction happens, for each unique element you have in the party, it will give the character wearing this set 50 more EM up to 150 EM for 3 different 
elements at max for 8 seconds. Then for each same element you have in the party, it will be 14% attack instead of EM, 42% for 3 same elements. Then we have a new 5 star bow, hunter's bow and a 4 star bow end of the line, adding a new member to the fish family weapon. Also there will be new craftable weapon series as usual, so save up those prototype billets. Remember to check out my other Sumeru videos that might have more information and theories on them. So check them out before you say why didn't you talk about this more. If I miss any minor details, make sure to leave them in a comment below. But don't put leaks because that's not very nice of you. If this video was helpful to you, make sure to smash that like button, punch my face here to subscribe to the channel. Let's get that small number to a big number. Check out these cool videos in the meantime. Thanks for watching, as always, this was Ekamin and until next time, let your imaginations run wild.